Continuous integration isn't just about running an automated build. It's a process where everyone on the team integrates frequently into mainline, at least once a day. In the next few minutes, I walk you through how continuous integration works and why commercial teams should seriously consider it over pull request based processes like Gitflow. And I'll share my personal experience from over 10 years of applying continuous integration in a large scale project. Stay tuned. Let's walk through the basic workflow of continuous integration. First, we pull the latest source code from the repository and build it. Then we make our changes, build and test them. We repeat that cycle until we are ready to submit. Before we submit, we pull again and resolve any merge conflicts. Then we build one more time and run relevant fast tests. We usually skip slow tests locally since they hurt productivity. Once tests are green, we submit our changes. In Git terms, we commit and push. Then we send the changes for review. Right after the commit, the continuous integration server picks it up and kicks off an automated build. It verifies the changes by running all relevant tests in a controlled environment. If the build is fast, we just wait for the feedback. In the meantime, we might check email, update the backlog or plan the next steps. But we don't write more code. If the build passes, we move on to the next increment or task. If it fails, we investigate. If it's a quick fix, we submit it right away. If not, we roll back the changes to unblock the mainline. If the build takes longer, we don't wait. We continue with the next increment. If it fails later, we pause our work, for example by committing current changes to a branch. Then we fix or roll back the previous change. Once this issue is resolved, we resume our paused work. Yes, you heard that right. With continuous integration, we don't create branches by default. We only do that when needed, for example to park pending work or to run a spike. More on that later. Yes, the build runs after submission and is usually configured for mainline only. And yes, the code review happens after integration to avoid blocking it. For more on why you should favor non-blocking reviews, check out this video. In continuous integration, every commit to mainline triggers a build. And since builds can fail, for example due to a failed test, the mainline might break temporarily. That's not necessarily bad, that's what builds are for. But we stick to the green to green principle. If mainline breaks, fixing it becomes top priority. Because we integrate often, each change is small, so it's easier to investigate, to fix or roll back. Some teams prefer pulling the latest green build instead of the latest commit just to be safe. In my experience, pulling the latest commit works fine 95% of the time. And even if the last commit is broken, the project is still always in a releasable state. We can release from the last green build. And if needed, we can always create a release branch from there. That's why monitoring the build state is so important with continuous integration. Most continuous integration servers offer dashboards for build status and history. Teams sharing a room often use a build light or an always on display to visualize the green or red status. So how do we actually make continuous integration work in practice? There are three key ingredients. The first ingredient for successful continuous integration is understanding that integration and release are not the same thing. That's why we don't wait for a feature to complete before integrating changes. Still, every change we integrate must have production quality. Sure, the feature might not be usable yet, maybe the workflow isn't complete or the UI is still missing. But that doesn't mean we submit untested or low quality code. Want to learn more about this topic? Check out my videos on branch by abstraction and feature flags. The second ingredient for successful continuous integration is the ability to break up large changes into a series of small increments. Let's say we are adding functionality to an existing feature. First we refactor the existing code using small increments until the actual change is easy. Each refactoring step, by definition, is behavioral non-breaking and is safe to integrate and even to release. Once that's done, adding the new functionality should be straightforward. If the functionality we want to add is bigger, or we want to add an entirely new feature, we also slice it into small increments. There are two common approaches, horizontal and vertical slicing. Horizontal slicing means we build the feature like a house, layer by layer. This approach is often easier, but we only get user feedback once the final layer, usually the UI, is in place. Vertical slicing starts with a walking skeleton across all layers. The first increment might include stubbed out classes with minimal API. Then we gradually build it up, touching all layers as we go. 
This approach typically takes more practice, but allows earlier feedback from end users. The third ingredient for successful continuous integration is fast builds. As a rule of thumb, fast means 10 minutes or less. To achieve that, we need fast tests. Many projects speed up their builds by running tests in parallel, even across machines. If the project is too large for one fast build, we use a build pipeline with multiple stages. The commit build runs after every commit and gives fast feedback. Slow tests, like those involving real databases or additional services, run in the second stage. That stage only starts if the first one succeeds. If the later stage fails, we don't call for stop the line immediately. Instead, the team defines a process that balances green to green and productivity. And when the build fails, we ask, can we catch this kind of issue earlier with a faster test in the commit stage? And if, after all optimization, the commit build is still too slow to run for every commit, we use a rolling build. It picks up all commits since the last green one. This works, but makes investigations harder when the build breaks. Continuous integration focuses on high integration frequency, which leads to several important benefits. First, integration is communication. It lets developers share what they have changed. Frequent communication means frequent feedback, which helps teams quickly detecting when there is a conflict between two developers. The sooner we detect conflicts, the easier they are to resolve. Continuous integration also emphasizes that we only know our code works when it's successfully integrated with everyone else's code. And the earlier we integrate, the earlier we know. Frequent integration also means we integrate smaller chunks. Smaller chunks cause smaller problems. Smaller problems are easier to solve. And remember, conflict resolution isn't just about merging text. It's also about catching semantic conflicts through tests. Integrating smaller chunks also makes progress more predictable. That lowers overall project risk. Finally, continuous integration also improves code quality. Every code base evolves. Designs that once made sense might need to change. Refactoring keeps the code base healthy. Continuous integration makes refactoring easier, especially in shared code. Because we integrate often, conflicts with other ongoing work are smaller. And when refactoring is easier, developers are more likely to do it as part of their daily work. Despite all the benefits, continuous integration isn't always the best fit. Continuous integration works best for commercial teams working full-time on a project. In open source, things are different. Anyone can propose changes and maintainers usually work part-time. In such a setup, pull requests are often the better option. They are gated by tests and reviewed by trusted maintainers. They also support offline discussion before any code is integrated. And the final decision remains with the maintainer, whether they pull the changes in or not. Working in small increments towards a final solution is great, but what if we don't know the solution yet? That's where we use bikes or prototypes to explore a problem. It's often easier to create a branch for this, allowing us to use version control during the spike. Of course, we do not integrate this branch. The output of a spike is knowledge, not production code. Once we know the solution, we start fresh on mainline, often by refactoring towards it. No project lives in isolation. We all depend on libraries from other teams or vendors. Ideally, we update these dependencies frequently too, but they come from outside our team, so we trust them less. That's why we might prefer using gated commits to verify them first. For example, by running a dedicated build that only submits the update if all tests pass. Or by using a dedicated branch that's merged into mainline only after successful verification. So far, I have shown the idle continuous integration setup as I have used it in many projects over the past two decades. But sometimes the idle setup isn't possible. Even then, Convinced by the benefits of continuous integration, I stick to its core principles as much as possible. Here is how we have tailored continuous integration in a large-scale project with multiple teams. The project started with a few 10,000 lines. Now, 15 years later, it's grown to around 7 million. We started with two teams, now we have 13. We have a huge unit test suite, but our most important feedback comes from slow component and UI-based tests. A typical commit build takes 30 to 45 minutes. That consists of the compilation and static code analysis only. First real tests run in a rolling build, which takes 1 to 4 hours, depending on the change. Clearly, classic continuous integration wouldn't work here. So here is what we do instead. Each team works on its own branch, branched from mainline. 
Each team defines a build pipeline, which typically consists of a commit build and a rolling build. Mainline uses gated check-ins, meaning changes from team branches are only integrated after a successful build. Code review is mandatory for all changes before merging to Mainline. Each team branch has an automated build that integrates changes from Mainline at least once per day. If that fails, for example due to a conflict, the team merges manually, which rarely happens. Another build runs multiple times per day to find an RI candidate, a commit ready to be integrated into Mainline. Here's how that works. First we collect all commits since the last integration into Mainline. Then we gather the build and review status for each one. From that list we pick the most recent commit that passes all gates and where all changes up to this one have been reviewed. This setup allows us to integrate changes within each team instantly and across teams once or twice a week. This approach worked well for us most of the time because most teams focus on their own part of the codebase. Shared code is touched by multiple teams but not too frequently. And only critical review findings are allowed to block integration to mainline, all other feedback is handled asynchronously. Of course this approach isn't perfect. Central refactorings can be challenging because of the delayed cross-team integration. Finding a good RI candidate usually works automatically, but it can become difficult if tests are flaky or reviews take too long. Still, this setup has served us well for over a decade and we plan to stick with it. What do you think leads to better software? Frequent integration or controlled submissions? Let me know in the comments.